think we're going to start. Um, welcome everybody to this uh, VCE lecture. Um, my name is Stefan Rache from the School of Physics here at University of Melbourne. I um, want to welcome everyone uh, in the audience and also on Zoom. Um, uh, before I start, I would like to um, uh, show my respect and acknowledge the um, Wurundjeri people, the um, traditional custodians of the land um, of elders past and present on which uh, the land on which this um, lecture takes place. So the title of my lecture is Resistance is Futile. And um, I'm going to, I hope, no, in the next 60 or 50 minutes, um, you're going to stand why, what the title means. And um, I want to start with something very simple. And, uh, but before I start, um, we have only very few people in the audience. And uh, uh, amazingly, almost only females to, uh, audience. This is very rare for physicists. So, <laughs> so. People in Zoom can't hear me, please write in the chat and complain. It's good? Okay, right. So I wanna start with something very simple. You all know, right? You might even say it's boring. And from there, we kind of start slowly become making things more interesting. I'm going to start with um, a battery. Boring, I promise you. And um, actually, I take three batteries. I may come to this later, why? And I have here a light bulb. I took this out of my bicycle this morning. Uh, these don't, if you, you can do this by yourself, it's not dangerous, okay? But please don't take a, uh, uh, from a stealing lamp, the bulb, don't do this, it might be dangerous, but you can take it out of the bicycle, but take it from your own bicycle, please. So um, let's connect this, okay? I have your wire to one side of the bulb and then to the second pole of the bulb and, oh, no surprise, here's light. Um, and that's actually what I held my hand would be just like a, a battery powered um, bicycle lamp. Okay, you all know this, probably you have this, probably you played around with this, okay? That's number one. Number two, what you all have also have done before, I assume, go to your fridge or your parents' fridge and grab a magnet or two magnets, right? You've certainly played with them as a kid and you know that um, depending what you're doing, they stick together like this. Well, probably you're Magnets look nicer than those, but nonetheless, they might stick together, or if you turn them around, they might not stick together so well, right? You probably know this, that you try to align them, it doesn't work. And we actually know that's why it's red and blue, there's something called the North Pole and South Pole of a magnet. And like the North and the South Pole, they attract each other, right? But opposite, uh, the same poles, they repel each other. They don't like each other. Uh, and you might have also played with this and wondered, Oh, if I put them on top, sure, that works. But if I turn it around um, and it repels each other, it almost seems to, it's not really stable, it seems to float almost, right? It's like almost like levitation. So if you try to, um, it's really not stable, but you might know what, I'm, you know, you might have tried this and we're wondering, maybe we can make something levitate. I promise you, we're gonna have some levitation later, some real levitation, okay? But you have to work to get there. So why did I show you these kind of boring things? Um, well, I want to take you on a journey with me all the way to what is called superconductor, okay? But to get there, as I said, we have to kind of take several intermediate steps. I have to work a little bit to get there. Now, anyone has an idea of what a superconductor is? Come on, everyone knows what a conductor is, right? So I'm sure that might be a superconductor, possibly. Okay, maybe it's a lame joke. Um, so I'm not gonna talk about super powered uh, women. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but nonetheless, I'm gonna show you later a superconductor, okay? And in fact, it has something to do with conductivity. It's something that's conducting, and it's to do with electricity, and, uh, but we're gonna figure this all out. All right, so now 
Um, back to battery and bulb. Um, what are we doing here actually? What is really going on in terms of physics? Maybe you have, this is part of what you should do in uh, year 11 or 12 uh, when you do physics in Victoria. So you might have done this before, you might know about it, right? So what is actually battery? What comes out of a battery or what is battery all about? Does anyone know? Any idea? Just say it. Voltage, wow, that's almost like far too quick. If you keep going like this, then we finish this lecture at five. Um, so voltage, you also know what the physical symbol is for that? V, wow, okay. Maybe this is all far too simple what we're doing here. Um, what else come, what else goes here? Anything else which has, to, well, the battery is about voltage and actually I can tell you, if I look at the battery, this is a double A standard battery, it says 1.5 V, so at 1.5 volts, okay. Now, uh, what about the light bulb? Why is it shining if we connect it to the um, battery? What is happening? Does anyone have an idea in this context? What could I write on a whiteboard? Current. Wow. Excellent. Actually, let me write electrical current. Okay. Uh, I mean, I understand that everyone knows that this is not a water current or anything, but uh, let me be precise. Electrical current. Does anyone know what the symbol is? I, very good. Okay, and what have these two quantities, voltage and electric current, what they, what, how are they related? Is there any relationship, maybe even a physical law, and what is missing in the whiteboard for those who might know, know already? If you don't know, no, don't worry. We kind of try to understand this in, in great detail in a moment, but I try to fill this here first. Anyone? Yes. Resistance, or oh, everyone, this is like, okay. Yes, Not, yeah. So this is resistance. I actually put, let me put this underneath. And there's an equal sign. So voltage is identical to the product of resistance times electrical current, okay? So obviously you know that already. So, um, but now um, let's try to kind of see if you really understand this, okay? This is an equation. I mean, no, you all get 11 and 12 and you're obviously very good, so this is going to be easy. We know if there's an equal sign, what you have on the left must be the same what is on the right. That also implies if I change this on the left, say I make this larger, then what must be happening if this is a correct relationship? Excellent, so this gets larger, meaning either the resistance gets larger or the current gets larger, right? And um, well, if I make this smaller, then this gets smaller. What hap what's happening if I keep this constant? Can I still change something? Suggestions? No? What do you, what do you think? Right, as long as the product is constant, it's fine. So this is constant. I can make this larger and this smaller, such that the product still is the same. Excellent. Okay, so now uh, let's test if this relationship actually makes sense, if that's working. And um, let's start with changing the voltage, okay? So we said this is a 1.5 volt battery. And maybe you know this, if you put two of them together, they behave like a three volt battery. And if I put, uh, put three of them in a row, oh, they fall on the ground, okay. So now I have three in a row and it's like now a 4.5 volt battery, okay? But obviously I need now several hands. That's why there's this practical uh, battery clip. You can just plug them in, they're connected in a row and I don't need three hands to hold it, just one, okay? And you've seen this already. I quickly do it, but uh, you have seen it before. Um, we get, um, well, the bulb is bright, wonderful. Now let's do the same thing with two batteries. They're no red, but it's still 1.5 volts battery together this three volts. And if I do this, see what's happening. See a difference? What do you think? Less bright, exactly. Can you see it in zoom? Okay. And finally, I have a single battery. 
And well, there's a switch, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't do anything. And now I have to come close to the camera. Can you see, still see something? There's a tiny, tiny little bit of glowing, right? It's kind of like a, like a, like a, almost invisible. Can you see that? Ah. And zoom, okay. All right. So obviously we made this smaller, 4.5, 3, 1.5 volts. And very pride, not so pride, and not pride at all. So what, what, what did change? What do you think? Did we change resistance? Why not? Light bulb and the wires didn't change, exactly. So the resistance must be the same. So obviously, this we had to get smaller. This was smaller. The product must be smaller. So what did we change, obviously? Someone else? This remains constant. Sorry, you believe? Yeah, that, that, but that's, that's what we kind of reduced by changing the batteries. Okay, now that I'm wondering what is changing on the right side. It must also change the same way. The electrical current, excellent, right? Because that's constant and doesn't change. So this must become smaller. And of course, if there's less electrical current, the light bulb is less bright. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, um, um, we'll talk about this in a second because now we really have to think why is less current less bright? Why is more current brighter? And what does the resistance do? And where is the resistance coming from? I mean, we didn't really discuss this, right? So we do this in a second. But first, I want to add something because this here is called uh, Ohm's law. And probably you never met, and you certainly did not met this person. Uh, he's dead for a very long time. But, um, and um, all his name is not George Simon, but Georg Simon, because he's German, but it's besides the point. But you see, he lived really a long, long time ago. And what you probably do not know, he was actually a high school teacher, and he figured this out, right? Which is amazing. So that's Ohm, and he came up with this law. We want to talk about no more. <clears throat> so, does anyone have an idea what resistance is? Why we have resistance? And how we could change it? Let's start with where's resistance coming from? Anyone has an idea? And I mean, really, the resistance now uh, in this uh, little circuit with the light bulb, the battery, okay? Anyone? The wire and the light bulb, they have a resistance, but why? Okay, this is actually something you cannot know in, in great detail because that actually requires to kind of fully understand this. You have to kind of to go to university and study there a lot. But nonetheless, I can explain this in four or five minutes to you, okay? And that's what I want to do. But first, let's use quickly an analogy. Let's go to water. You know, if you have like, think of a water pipe, maybe which is like, has, which is kind of, uh, has a shape of a circle, right? It goes around. You could even do this at a beach, make something like a, uh, you know, something like a tunnel or so. Now you have water in this. Now you start something, you use the water wheel and you drive the water, it starts flowing, you get a water current, okay? But immediately if you kind of stop the wheel, kind of this water circle, uh, sorry, the water current will also stop. Why? Why doesn't it keep going? Does anyone know why? If you, have, you know what I'm talking about, right? You have water and you start pushing it and it flows, but then you stop and the water stops immediately. Just like when I put battery away, the light bulb turns dark. Why is that? Anyone has an idea? Energy. Oh, wow. Here, big, big words already. It's, it has to do with energy. But um, let's first think what's really happening when you think of the water which is flowing. Why, why does it not just keep going? What do you think? But I mean, it's already flowing, right? It's like if I, if I take a ball, bowling, and it keeps going. Why does the water not keep going? Why does the electrical current not keep going? Resistance, but what is really happening? Think of the water. I tell you what's happening. It's actually the friction, the water with the pipe and between the water molecules, which you can't see, but it's what's happening. So now, what does this have to do with the light bulb water? Actually a lot. Um, instead of, instead of um, having water and water molecules, we have what is called electrons. Have you ever heard about electrons? So 
That here is an atom, the core of an atom, and uh, we can't really see it, but let's suppose it's that big. Then there are also some electrons flying around which belong to this atom, and they can be far away. So I call this E, make their minus sign to show that this is negatively charged, while the atom core, the ion, is positively charged. And well, it kind of really kind of flies around like this. In, in reality, it's actually far, far away. It's not, doesn't fit in this room, right? But it doesn't matter for the time being, okay? And these electrons, they, you can imagine them as tiny tennis balls. We can't see them again. They're super, super small. And they're quantum mechanical. Nonetheless, imagine I have now a bucket of these tennis balls and I want to throw them, okay? So I take them and throw them through the hole, okay? And they're not just going through the hole. They kind of bump against each other. They kind of get stuck at the door. They might kind of hit the, the trolley. They might hit this chair and so on and so forth, okay? And the same is happening with these electrons. So just imagine we have now these atoms. And these atoms, they form everything. The table, the magnet, this pen, everything is made out of atoms. So say we have them here and they form a periodic arrangement, some what we call a crystal, okay? And this is exactly um, what the wire is made out of, okay? And these electrons, now they want to go through. And of course, you could say, oh, maybe they just go through, not a problem, but it's not what's happening because there's a lot of things going on. They might actually do this, boom, and they bump here, forth and back. And uh, yeah, it's not working well. And maybe what another electron is doing that. And it just goes backwards. Not good, right? And then there could be two electrons. They could also bump against each other like this. And just like tennis balls, they go in opposite directions. So you see, if you throw now thousands of electrons through this kind of crystal, they're not coming through easily. And you know what's happening when they hit these atoms, when they hit each other? They have kinetic energy and they bump against it and they kind of slow down. And where's the energy going? We talked about energy and we all know energy is conserved. So where's the energy going? Bum, bum, bum. Where is it going? This is so heavy, it's not really moving, right? It's not momentum conservation or anything. Anyone has an idea? I'll give you a hint. What do you think I feel if I touch the back of my computer? Heat, wow. So that's exactly how you get heat, okay? There's electrical current flowing. It bumps against the crystal, against, against atoms, against other electrons that produces heat. Energy is transformed into heat. And that's exactly what is resistance, okay? And um, yeah, so that's why I'm not convinced. <laughs> that's why, you know, everything kind of all electrical devices become hot, light bulbs become hot, unless they're made out of LEDs, then they're not so hot. And uh, uh, computers are hot and everything, okay? That's essentially all resistance. You can feed it all the time, okay? That's actually a big problem because, I mean, in terms of climate change, think of the internet, you have these huge computer systems like for Google, and they produce amounts of heat. This is unbelievable. You have to cool them down. It costs so much energy. So if there was no resistance, wow, we would save so much energy and we would do so much about climate change, okay? So to get rid of resistance is actually kind of very important for technological reasons for everyone, okay? All right. Um, now, I think you got this. Um, again, if it's not clear, please ask. But what I want to do next is now the following. We said we can change voltage and we have understand this. Now the question is now, how can we possibly change resistance? Anyone have an idea? Back to my bulb, right? Bulb, battery, wire, what could we do possibly? If, th if this is true, right? So that's here, that's my wire. Lots of atoms in there, electrons get stuck and they bounce forth and back produce heat, that's why there's resistance. So how could we possibly change the resistance? Anyone has an idea? A conductor? I mean, the wires are conductors. Otherwise, that would be possible, right? If it was like an insulator or something like that, that the electrons were forbidden to kind of pass through. Uh, we have already a conductor, but the question is how can we make it more or less conducting, okay? And that's kind of equivalent of saying, how could we change resistance? You have a question? Oh, wow. Okay, I write this down. Um, other ideas? Bent 
Bends are material. Okay, if you change this here, you actually use another material, say from um, iron, you can maybe change to, um, also from, from, um, from uh, copper, you maybe change to brass or anything, right? So, so that, that's exactly true. We can change, the, let's try to change the material, okay? Uh, online as well, excellent. Thank you. Audience and Zoom, other ideas? Stretch a longer wire. Then you have much more of these things in a row. There's much more scattering events, much more bouncing forth and back, more resistance. Excellent, if it's true. Okay, and we could go on, but I mean, we want to do other stuff, so let's let's uh, stop here. And um, well, let's test that example actually. That is the suggestion. I take the battery. Um, let me remind you again. It's still bright. Okay. Now, longer wire. Let's see, much longer wire. Did it change? Uh, not so much. Maybe even longer. I know. Maybe we're wrong. Okay. Uh, anyone has an idea what, what's going on here? It's actually not, that's actually even a bit complicated now. So I help you. The, the truth, you're perfectly correct. This increases the resistance. However, the bulb itself has a resistance and that's actually more important than the wire itself, right? That's why that can be neglected and the largest resistance is in there. That's why it doesn't change. However, you could make it much, much longer and then maybe you see a difference. And I got you something. It was 25 meters of wire, okay? So maybe that works then. You have this on camera, Steve? Yeah. yeah. Or should I come closer? I can come closer. I can move. <laughs> okay, so this is what it is before. I can already connect it, but still um, put it together. This is without the long wire. This is the bright light, can you see that? And now we extend it by 25 meters. It's still there, but can you see the difference now? Yeah. Okay, again. Before, this is very bright. And this is a little less bright. You see it? Leave me. Okay, thank you. You see, although we have 25 meters, it's still not a super large effect. We probably need 100 meters next time, I promise. And then it would probably get really dark. So you see, length, excellent. Um, material, the same thing. Um, it works in principle, but we have to kind of work harder because the, 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 the bulb itself has larger resistance. Now, there was interesting suggestions in uh, Zoom to um, change the temperature. So how do we change temperature? Ideas. Anyone? Come on. How do we change temperature? Of course, you turn on the heat or the AC. But I mean, um, maybe that's not enough, right? Remember, 25 meters didn't do anything. So maybe we have to drastically change the temperature. More voltage. Uh, but then it gets hot and we need a lot, a lot of voltage and that's kind of not allowed for security reasons. So um, I'm, not, I'm not qualified. So we need then some experts to use high voltage to get it very hot. But maybe that's another way of heating stuff up. Could make a fire. Uh, university doesn't allow it either. Uh, but what we can do, we can cool stuff down. And I think the person actually didn't say change the temperature, but it said cool down. So we really want to cool stuff down. And don't worry, I'm not turning on the AC. Uh, yeah, the AC, but instead we're using something to cool, uh, which is called liquid nitrogen. Um, we do this in a second, uh, but before can we... Can someone ask, can you change temperature with minimal temperature? I mean, um, I mean, electromagnets, they get hot, but this is again because of Ohm's resistance. So, but maybe you have to think more about this. Maybe there's more to it, but it's not obviously clear, okay? Okay, who knows what is liquid nitrogen? Yeah, that's it, okay. <laughs> so you've seen this before in a lecture demo or so? Okay, but it's still fun. Okay, uh, please don't do this at home. I also hope you don't have liquid nitrogen at home, um, but if you do, be careful, okay? Um, so, Liquid nitrogen.
This is what chemists to dry down. And now, what do we do with liquid nitrogen? Why can we cool something with it? Anyone has an idea? Who has never heard about liquid, liquid nitrogen before? It's, it's, it's not a problem. It's, I think it's not on the uh, VCE curriculum, so you don't need to know about it, I think. Okay. Look, say this is temperature, okay? Temperature. So, um, what happens at 100 degrees Celsius? Water, boiling point of water, okay? A boiling point. And water, liquid water, turns into water steam, into gas. Very good. Another important point, zero degrees Celsius. What is happening there? So that's correct. Uh, it's called this uh, freezing point, maybe. And we all know this is where water turns into ice, ice cubes, perfect. We need this every day, at least in the summertime. Um, and here, water is solid, here it's liquid, and here it's gas, okay? Now, you know what liquid nitrogen does? It also has a freezing and a boiling point, but it's a little bit different, okay? So, Minus one, minus 19, not quite. Minus 196 degrees Celsius. It's really cold, okay? That's the boiling point. Actually, I should make this clear, so there's no confusion. So this is water. Okay, liquid gas, solid, and now we've read liquid nitrogen. And then I think here at minus, oh, it's actually more here, minus 210 degrees Celsius, that's the freezing point of liquid nitrogen. Freeze, okay? And actually, but so I mean, talk about this more in a second, but does anyone know how far we can go here on the left? Does it go to minus infinity? Where does it go? One Kelvin? Other options? That's not Celsius, you're talking Kelvin. Oh, no, that's kind of complicated. Uh, but that, that is both uh, more or less correct. So here, minus 273.15, that's what we call absolute zero. As I call absolute zero because this is what we also call zero Kelvin, okay? And um, the universe is, by the way, not exactly zero, but I think 2.7 Kelvin, is that correct? Close to three Kelvin. That's like the average temperature in the universe far away. So it's really cold. So you don't want to be there without a good jumper, okay? Um, um, this is corresponds in Kelvin to um, um, 66, and that's, uh, uh, or 63, I think, Kelvin, and that's 77 Kelvin, and so on. And then obviously this is plus 273 Kelvin, and so on. So it's just another unit, okay? But you can just always, you see, you just have to shift it. Now again, do you believe me? I tell you, we have it actually here minus 200 degrees Celsius, okay? So you don't want to touch it. And um, it's really liquid, a liquid state. And of course, if you, if you kind of pour, pour it on the, on the floor, it kind of gets into connected with the environment, which is room temperature, so it's super hot. This it immediately kind of raises the temperature of the, of the liquid nitrogen and it becomes gas and it just goes away. Don't, don't worry, we have enough ventilation here, it's not dangerous, um, uh, but don't touch it, okay? So, and if we put something in liquid nitrogen here, well, then we cool it down drastically. Does it make, does it make sense? Okay, so I can show you. Um, actually, some safety since we're here on camera. Um, so it's really liquid. I'm gonna show you a little bit. Have you seen that? Okay. Now, what we're going to do is um, we want to kind of take the battery and the bulb, 
but obviously I cannot put this really into this thermos here, right? So that's why um, here are our experts, that's actually Steve, he's the most important person. Uh, always he's not standing here, without him, that's not, that's not possible, right? So keep that in mind. Um, and we have here a light bulb connected and then there's kind of a thin wire um, and this is just kind of kind of bent around this kind of um, um, cover rod just to kind of um, to kind of stabilize it, right? And we can take this and put it in the thermos. And that way this part of the wire gets kind of really, really cold, okay? And um, so let me turn this on. Okay, it can make this bright. Okay, but we go, um, I think we go it kind of make it as dark as possible. Okay, you still see it? Okay, it's almost, almost gone. Now we must, that only works once because then it's cool, okay? Room temperature, now we plug it in, then we're at minus 200 degrees Celsius, okay? Let's go. Okay, you see it? Got light, okay. Before it was almost gone, and now, it's not super bright, it's getting a small effect, but you can clearly see it, okay, even from where you sit. Okay, so, temperature. Reduces the resistance, and since the voltage is the same, we reduce that, uh, sorry, we reduce the resistance, then the current must increase. Current can better flow, okay. Excellent, I'll take this out again. And we could do it again, but if to wait like five minutes, that's why if you want, I can show it at the end of the lecture again, okay? But we have other interesting stuff to do. That's why we have to proceed. Do you have questions about this? Okay, now I have a question for you. In this picture, why does now the resistance go down if you cool it? There's no temperature in this picture. What's, what, what, what's the idea here? Anyone has an idea? How much they move? It's actually good. But I mean, we want them to move so the electrons should go through and make electric transport. Question from the audience. Excellent. Wow, I just wanted to say it. Is this a physics teacher in the audience? Or a professor? <laughs> or a professor? Okay, I, the picture wasn't quite accurate here. What's actually happening is not just that they go through, but actually if they vibrate like this, you know, they really like they do this. And now imagine there comes electrons through. They, of course, they bump, they kind of scatter much more because they all kind of somehow move widely. Also, they kind of have more vibrations and so on, right? I mean, we could talk about this in more detail, but it's a rough idea. This kind of, if you cool down, they relax, they really calm down. They're getting cool, you know, they're cool now and then you can more easily pass through. More electric current can go through, less scattering events, less bouncing against each other. That's why we have more electric current and the light bulb turns brighter, okay? Does that make sense? Wonderful. What's next? What is next? Um, so, kind of just, learned that if this here is resistance and that's temperature, temperature, um, say this was room temperature, that was the resistance and now we kind of cooled it down and that means this is zero, that's like say 300 Kelvin, that's room temperature, okay. And now say we kind of brought it down to um, say 80 Kelvin that's where we put it in the thermos, cool it down, and it was less resistance, okay? Stay here. And if we did this kind of more careful, if we did a real experiment and had the better equipment than just the thermos and um, this old stuff, right? We would probably get more points here, okay? More data points, you could really do an actual experiment. And then you would see that that's what a, what a resistance does. There's a curve going down. Now I'm asking you, what do you expect what's happening if you go try to get as close as possible to zero temperature, to this absolute zero. We might not get there quite to zero, but maybe close. So what would we expect when we look at this? You know, just intuition. 
it goes down and it just keeps going, right? So you would say, look, this is all perfect. Why should something change? Okay. Okay. But what is happening instead is something completely unexpected. Um, you see this gentleman? At that time, scientists were all men, white hair, old. This has changed. Now we have lots of women, believe me. And um, they're younger. And um, they're kind of standing in the, of, in the background. You see a huge apparatus. This was actually 1911, OK? So none of us were, was born at the time. It was a really long time ago. It was in the Netherlands. This guy is, this guy is called Heike Kamling Onnes. And um, what they did, they kind of were the first who could liquefy helium. Helium has even a lower boiling point than nitrogen, liquid nitrogen, and that could, they could bring it down to three or four Kelvin, okay? But it would work really hard. See what they have here. So here, this is like, um, they have like uh, liquid air in this kind of chamber inside this enzyme, um, 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 liquid and gas with hydrogen. And then um, you see um, kind of um, at the end of the day, you have kind of the red stuff is the liquid um, helium and inside was the sample they were measuring this. They were measuring a metal a conductor, which is called mercury. It's the stuff you don't want to eat, don't want to touch too much, okay? But they did the experiment anyway because it was kind of a good thing to make an experiment on, okay? And they measured resistance just like we did, had this curve, and that's what they found, okay? You see this so up there? That's like the last point of this slope. But then it didn't go further. It just stopped and went all the down, way down to zero here. Wow, okay? Resistance gone. And the reason is kind of, um, at that time, nobody understood. It took almost 50, 40, 50 years to understand that. Nonetheless, for discovery, this person got a Nobel Prize in physics. And what's happening here, that's what we call a superconductor. Now it makes actually sense. That up there is the conductor, and now we have no resistance whatsoever, and that's the superconductor, okay? Unfortunately, I cannot do this experiment here. We really need some you know, some real equipment, which is expensive, and we can't do the lecture hall. Um, but um, that's not a problem, but we can, because later we can do something else. So. Oh, there are three whiteboards. That's cool. Um, now. Um, maybe very quickly, um, this is the re reason why the resistance disappears. That is something which is purely um, a pure quantum effect, okay? So this is something which is not in the curriculum uh, of year 11 or 12 in Victoria, and in, it's in no, not really in high school in any country, okay? So this is something you really have to go uh, decide, well, I want to go to university, I would recommend Melbourne Uni, and then choose a Bachelor of Science, and then we can explain you how this in detail. But you really, what is happening? I just, I mean, it's just explained this like in, in, in two or three sentences. One electron bound together immediately, okay? They form a new object, they tie together, but they're not close, yet they're kind of tied together. There's no way of kind of taking them apart. And now they can actually move or flow through the conduct, the conduct or this kind of lattice as before, but there are quantum mechanical laws who forbid them to bounce off from these atoms, okay? They just prevent them, and there's no way for these uh, new bound pair of electrons to scatter off from each other, from other electron pairs, or from these atom cores, okay? If you now say, I don't understand why, Again, that's something you have to believe me. And if you do not believe me, then you have to come here and we can, can work this out, okay? But it's gonna take a while. Um, and um, that's also the reason why it took long, people very long to understand what's going on because it's completely unexpected. Nonetheless, they're not allowed to bounce off. That's why there's no heat, there's no ohm resistance, and that's why it's a superconductor. Okay, let me write this down, that what a superconductor is, because that's what we wanna learn about today. A superconductor is, or a superconductor, one has zero 
Persistence. And it's going to be a two, but we need 10 more minutes to get there. Okay. Um, we can't do this here, unfortunately, but we are going to do this later. Okay. But first, you have to give me 10 minutes. So we come back to my magnets from the beginning. Okay. And um, I'm going to show you something. Um, or actually, let me. So the question is. You know, kind of even if, if even if I don't touch them, I can feel somehow that there's a force repelling them. If you want, you can later try, but I assume you all have played with, with, with uh, magnets before. So they're, they're not touching each other, yet I can feel there's a force, something which kind of pushes them apart. And the question is, why is that? There must be something invisible, invisible which causes that. Does anyone have an idea? Have you heard about there's something, the magnet has a magnetic field. Oh, audience, Sue. I think it's Isabella. It's a professor? No, it's not. Um, it's Isabella this time. So if it suggests it's a magnetic field. A magnetic field, oh, excellent. Does anyone know, has anyone seen a magnetic field? No, have you seen one? There's that cool picture that's come out with the black hole and it's a magnetic field. Have you seen that? In your galaxy? Yeah. Oh, I don't have it here. Um, <laughs> um, um, so that what is happening is that actually, you know, you might wonder why is it there's always a north and south pole? If I put them together, I have a new north and south pole. If we break it in the middle, we can have a north and south pole. So apparently there's always a north and south pole. The question is how can this be? And um, what is actually, what is happening is that a magnet, which is north, that's south, they're coming magnetic field lines out of it, right? The magnetic fields, we have like that. Actually, it's not like that, if you might think, right? It's not like that. These lines, they can't stop, okay? They always have to be closed. And they're invisible, but you can feel them, okay? And now it makes sense that if these, and they kind of say they're kind of directed in this direction, like this, they always kind of point from the north to the south pole. If I now bring another magnet close by, in opposite direction, it also has kind of field lines, which kind of then they start to repel each other, okay? And that's what we can feel. And you might not believe me because I'm just telling stories maybe. So um, I wanna show you this. Um, you see this? So, okay, this is, uh, I think this is uh, from last century or even before that century, I don't know. Uh, probably older than all of us. But they're kind of tiny compass needles, okay? And they actually respond to the magnet, okay? Can you see that? Um, if I put them there, they kind of follow the magnet, okay? And even if I'm further away, you can kind of try to uh, move them around. And I'm in prince, but if I put it here, I can try this quickly. And there is a better magnet somewhere. Yep. So, you see this? As I said, it's very old. Many of the needles are stuck. That's why it's not perfect. Okay, but I think we get the idea. So let's put, let's put this here. Can you see something? In principle, you should see that they, are, they kind of turn around and go back and come in where it's blue. Can you see this? Some of them are stuck, obviously, right? So you can see that some of them, they're just doing the wrong thing. Um, so they come here, like this one is, that's just wrong. This right row is wrong, but otherwise they're doing the right thing. Go around, like from the red North Pole, the lines go out, point in the right direction and come back, okay? And I feel a very strong magnet. It's one is so strong, you can hardly kind of pull it, but it comes to you, it come to you. So you can, it's very difficult to get them apart and it's actually dangerous because you can, if you get your skin like this, then it kind of hurts very badly, okay? But on the opposite, you kind of try to, it's all impossible to put it together. And again, maybe don't play with it because you can hurt yourself. However, let's see if it does a better job. This is a little better. 
or the same effect, but you can really see there's this shape what I've been drawing here on the whiteboard, right? It's really exactly like this. And, okay. And I actually want to show you um, something similar. Um, I have here some iron powder, the camera ones. It's really kind of just tiny particles of iron, okay? Is seed and zoom, which is in there? Okay. Also for the audience, look, it's really just, it's essentially powder of iron. And these iron particles, you can think of them as tiny magnets of north and south poles. They're really small, like 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 ten tenths of a millimeter or so. Okay. And now the best place to get them is out of your cereal packet. I'm not joking, like you can they put iron filings in your cereal to give you iron. So if you get a magnet at the bottom of your cereal packet, you can just like three iron filings. No. There's an often south pole and lines should get out, right? And it's a really strong magnet. Let's see what's happening if I put this underneath. Look at this. Can you, can you see this on the camera? It really stands up. It follows some of the lines, right? Of course it has to battle the gravitational force because they have some weight, but you can really see, oh, actually, whoa, okay. You can really see how they kind of start, how they come out, okay? And if I put it away, just fall down. Okay, you see that? You can play later if you, if, you want, if you want. So, obviously we have these magnetic field lines. But now I'm wondering, maybe if you have a magnet which is strong enough, maybe we can make it levitate, okay? After all, but the reality is that whenever you try something, you know, like, um, like this here, and I wanna make it levitate, this was the wrong direction, turn it around. It, it's never stable, it always, it always falls off, okay? It always falls off, whatever I do, you can try it later, but it's not that, it will always turn around and do that, okay? I cannot make it levitate. I wanna really have, I wanna float things like a wizard, but it's not, not working. That's why we kind of um, have to kind of come back to the superconductor. And, okay, now I have light again. And um, I just tell you what, what a superconductor does. Oh, by the way, that's a picture I found on the internet. Also like buried or iron powder, just with a better uh, magnet, where you can nicely see the lines as well. But I think I convinced you anyway by now. And um, here you see an inflected line. Now, what I show you here, that's kind of what we do now in the last five minutes. It's kind of the second property of a superconductor and that is called the Meissner effect. And it has, first of all, it seems to have nothing to do with the vanishing resistance of the superconductor. But the second thing, the second defining property of a superconductor is a very interesting one. So this blue sphere is a superconductor. And if it's really warm, it's just a conductor. You know, we have an ohm resistance, it's boring. And a mechanic field line, of course they go through because they go through everything, okay? Now, if I turn on, if I cool it down, below um, a temperature where the superconductor becomes superconducting, this is where this jump is in the resistance curve, it pushes out the magnetic field lines. Look at this, I mean it's a drawing, okay, but it's really what's happening. It expels the magnetic field from its interior. And actually, it does it regardless of, um, you know, whether the lines are here and they cool down, or I cool down first and then apply the magnetic field. So whatever I do, if a superconductor becomes superconducting at low temperatures, it pushes out the magnetic field lines, okay? And now, of course, you could wonder, huh, if it does that, maybe we can kind of put something on top, a magnet, and make it levitate, or I put a magnet underneath and put a superconductor on top, and maybe, because it does that, maybe it starts levitating. What do you think? Any idea, do you think it might work? Anyone else? I don't think it will work. You know why? It would also fall off. Just like the magnets, it wouldn't be stable. We need something else which is called quantum locking. And it's a big word for something, a very simple idea. We're gonna need some tiny holes in there. Did you think about that? Some tiny holes that one or two or three of these lines can go 
to the superconductor and stabilize it, can lock it such that it can't fall off. Okay, and you know, you might now say, okay, that's an absurd idea. Now it just gets uh, unbelievable here. Um, this is actually, um, I have something like that. Okay, that's such a superconductor for, for, for real. Uh, it's actually called a type two superconductor and type two just means, first of all, this is a high temperature superconductor, meaning we don't need to go to four Kelvin. We just have to go to 100, 110 Kelvin, meaning if you put it in there, it becomes superconducting. Okay, here for zoom, it's YBCO, it's the name, but it doesn't matter. Ethium, barium, copper oxide, that's just a chemical name. And um, it's a type two superconductor and type two means the following. If we apply a magnetic field, Okay, if you apply magnetic field, but first of all, of course, as before, there's this Meissner effect and the magnetic field has to go around it, right? So that, that might work with levitation after all. However, since it's type two, it has tiny holes. They're really, really tiny. You can't see them, okay? They're like microscopically small, like a few atom sizes large, say like here. Maybe here, maybe here, okay. And probably a few more, it doesn't matter. The point is that it's just large enough that maybe one field line can go through. And maybe here more, just going through. And that is called quantum locking. A few magnetic field lines um, pin or go through these tiny holes. And these tiny holes are called vortices. Could explain why, but it takes another 10 minutes, so I don't do it. Just let's say they're tiny holes. They're just a few, it's a tiny fraction, right? It's not like, like half the magnetic goes through. It's a tiny fraction. So the majority of magnetic fields wants to levitate it, okay? And well, let's see if that's all true, because we gotta do this now. It turned in the one format yeah. the camera. Okay, we don't need this right now. So, what we have, there's nothing magic. We really could come here and touch it if you want. Uh, you, you actually can come and touch. So I need at least one person to really come and help me. And it's really just something, um, it's all very standard. There's nothing. Um, um, you know, no tricks, no cheating. We have this superconductor from before. And um, what we're gonna do now, we have here a tiny magnet. Okay, it's a strong magnet, but it's very small because it's also a kind of rather small superconductor, which is not the best quality. Otherwise it would be like, if this was a perfect high quality superconductor, it would be worth tens of thousands. It's a low quality, that's why we can afford it here in the lecture hall. And I don't need to be worried that someone comes and mugs me. And that's the kind of small magnet. Now we cool this down and then let's see if you get a levitation, okay? Almost over time, but I would really recommend you stay now. Okay. First, we have to cool the superconductor because right now it's just the conductor. Actually, if you wonder what it looks like, this is exactly what's happening if you pour, oh, that was too much, sorry. You pour water on a, on a um, elect, you know, from electric stove on a hot plate, okay? You get this little ball, you notice, when you have water on a, on a hot plate, that's exactly what it looks like because this is boiling, okay? So now we let it cool it a bit more. And then if I'm right, if physics is right, 
maybe there's something, if you want, you can really come closer, uh, that because it's really small to see, just come here to the table. As long as you're not in front of the camera, that's fine. Okay, Let's see if that's working. Oh, wow, look at this. Ah, come, come closer, so we get this under control. You know, let's cool it more first. So it really looks like, looks like boiling water, right? Okay. You wanna do me the honor? Take the paper and move it underneath the magnet because if there are kind of some strings attached, if I'm cheating, now you can kind of reveal it, right? Oh. <laughs> maybe there are strings. Take both hands maybe, and then you can kind of, wow. Okay, no strings attached. <laughs> okay, and now we can do more actually. Um, we can kind of push it. <laughs> you know what this is? These vortices, they can actually move around. So I push it and there are no defects in there, it just keeps going forever. There is a defect because of low quality, I told you it's cheap. <laughs> but I mean, um, in principle, look, it's spinning. It's not so bad, right? Oh, it's almost gone. You can also put it try higher. Oh, that's not so good. Keep it lower. We can, in principle, you know, kind of if you kind of push it by hand, I try to move in or out magnetic fields lines because I have a lot of force. I kind of light this tiny object. Anyone else want to push it? You want to give it a push? Let's try it. Very careful, otherwise you kick it off. Just a kind of little tip. Yeah, here we go. That's cool, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, we have more cool stuff. <laughs> so, I mean, I like this very much because it really shows you quantum physics. It shows you this is all true, I told you, essentially. Um, now, look what we have here. It's kind of still a superconductor, but very thin, so it's less weight. And in the, in the middle is some styrofoam that it kind of can absorb some of the liquid nitrogen, so it cools it further, okay? And um, do this really the old-fashioned way. So let's put this in. And we have here uh, these kind of round magnets, okay? And these are normal magnets. This is not really for the demonstration purposes. Yeah, it's really worth talking for an hour to do this. This is the part where you shouldn't touch it with your fingers because it kind of uh, gets stuck in your fingers. That's why I'm wearing gloves. So let's see if that works too. And in principle, you could try to kind of move it even a little higher maybe. That's the highest it gets. Otherwise, you have to cool it stronger. But you can push, push it down, okay? And then it gets locked. Now, if I just do a little that, kind of, it gets, it doesn't move away, right? But oh, it spins because it's a round magnet. See what if you can do more than that. Move it a little from the side like this. Is that cool or is it cool? <laughs> uh, now let's push it further. I'll see how good these magnetic field lines are. Maybe we cool it first. Because the room temperature kind of heats it up quickly. Then it loses again its superconductivity, it becomes normal, then it falls off. So we have to cool it all the time. So obviously, for you know, if you want to have a chair which spins around, so it's kind of it's always have poor liquid nitrogen on it. So it's kind of uh, uh, come on. So what I want to show you now. Okay, what do you think is happening if I turn it around? Maybe falls off, makes a mess, it falls down. What I, was, what I intended to show you, 
Oh, it doesn't work. Yeah, it's not cool enough. <laughs> Falls on the ground, gets in contact with the warm floor. It's a huge difference, right? It's like 300 Kelvin compared to 80 Kelvin. That's why it immediately doesn't superconduct anymore. Or something's wrong with the physics. But usually physics is never wrong, right? It's always only, only the people who get it wrong. Uh, Yes, that's why we take this, which is much less weight than that one. That's exactly the reason. Again. Okay, no strings attached again. It's really quantum locking, so the magnetic field lines are stuck, the superconducting holes and these tiny holes, which are not superconducting, it goes through, and it can't, ex it can't escape unless it becomes the wall. <laughs> not superconducting anymore. I'll show you something else, final, for the final, final demonstration. Uh, if you go, if you check this like levitation, superconductor on YouTube, there's amazing stuff people do, and got inspired, but we're not that far, not that so far, we wanna build something much cooler, but this is a start. Let's say we have this, and let's think of a super, like a levitating, like a floating train or something like that. Maybe you could even sit on it one day with, with more expensive magnets, more expensive superconductors. Uh, okay, so that works. Now let's see if you can make it. Okay. Or you can do it like this. And in principle, if this was a perfect arrangement of magnets and this was a stronger superconductor, you could just push it and say it was like a circular shaped track of magnets, it would go round and round and round until it gets too warm and falls down. Let's see if that what the superconductor works too. Okay, so that kind of concludes the lecture. I um, can keep playing here and uh, you can ask questions and also play with it. But um, maybe we can, in the meantime, start with questions, either your questions or our Zoom audience's questions. Anyone? This is really tricky today. I have a question, what's the difference between a superconductive levitation train and a maglev, are they the same or are they the same? Uh, I think it's the same, I'm not sure what a maglev is. Is this like this um, thing and uh, this kind of train in Shanghai? Yeah, and yeah I think it's similar. Oh, look, it works as well. But, um, one question from Sophia, what was the second part of the superconductor that was about the magnetic field? Yeah, oh, lecture's not yet over, sorry. <laughs> so keep levitating. Um, a superconductor expels the magnetic field. You can stay there, don't worry. We're kind of done after a sec, after I've written those down. It expels the magnetic field from its interior. Okay. Theory. That's the second property. Yeah, sorry for the messed up uh, whiteboard. It's also not really clean, but I think you got the idea of that this works. Okay. And um, yeah, so back up the question. I really don't know what this uh, Mac leaf or so is, but if it's this kind of train uh, which runs between Shanghai and the other big city, that actually uses uh, similar technology that you can resistance free um, float on a track, I think. And um, so you see this principle is commercially um, um, usable, although it's always annoying to kind of cool it down. It's already probably too warm. Then maybe use that again here. And my other question. Yes. Is you talked about reducing the resistance and helping climate change and reducing the amount of energy we have in our world. How much energy does it take to make liquid nitrogen? And how much liquid nitrogen do you need? Yeah. Is that a counterbalance? Is that a reasonable counterbalance? 
uh, yes and no. It depends on what we're talking about. Of course, if I want to kind of cool down my laptop to 50 Kelvin uh, with liquid nitrogen, that's not going to be successful. That's that's much more expensive than the baby benefit from saving energy. However, imagine like very long distance electrical wires, and they kind of give much of the energy. They just kind of uh, kind of go, which goes away from heating from Ohm's resistance, right? And they actually wires, which um, these are wires, which um, 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 you know, kind of, they kind of have this core. It's a normal electrical wire for high voltages, maybe. And then this here is filled with liquid nitrogen, okay? And that way you can actually kind of uh, transport electricity without loss of resistance. And it's more, it's kind of, kind of profitable to kind of put in the liquid nitrogen, which is expensive, because you kind of save all the electricity. So that for some reason, you don't always do it, right? Not all the, the power lines have that, but for some specific um, um, applications that can be used and, um, but of course you're right. As long as you have to use liquid nitrogen, this is not gonna be the sole solution of all our problems. However, imagine, and now it's getting interesting, what a physicist now does is to say, huh, that's cold, but it works. So can I make a superconductor where I only need a little liquid nitrogen, or can I make one day a superconductor which levitates at room temperature? And that's what people try, of course, and they try hard, but if you wanna kind of be part of that endeavor, you really have to get here and study physics, and then you can start, right? There's nothing you can do in high school. It's kind of rather complicated, but people trying this, and uh, it's difficult, but this is one of the big uh, goals, maybe even one of the holy grails to get a superconductor at room temperature because that would solve many, many problems you're having, right? Uh, another question from Sophia says, has this crack, I'm assuming she's talking about the superconductor ever been done in space, uh, and would it work in space? They wouldn't make it cooler, would they? Because outside space yeah. would be. Yeah, if you do this, say outside at the International Space Station, you could just put this outside and it would be superconductor. You don't need to do anything. The question is what, what you need it for. But in principle, that should work, yeah? Um, superconductors work, um, they don't need um, an atmosphere, right? Could work in vacuum. Also, it works in the high pressures if you want. And so, yeah, that. I'm not aware that anyone has done it, uh, but, but that, that's definitely possible. Other questions from, yeah? You mentioned that um, at really low temperatures, electrons combine to turn into a different particle with different properties. Yeah. Actually, this is called a Cooper pair, this kind of new particle, but go ahead, sorry. Uh, I was going to ask if it was because the electrons, they have half integer spin. So would they combine, would they have an integer spin and turn to a boson? So yes, different yes. Yes, well, yeah. I, I, I dared not to mention any of that because I thought that's when all the people run away. But it's very easy correct, yeah? These particles have half spin, they call fermions. You pair two of them. The new particles, they call bosons. And actually what they do, it's very similar, we might heard about this, it's called bose einstein condensation. These new coupled pairs, they can then kind of do this con transition, what is called bose einstein condensation. And that's exactly the same thing, that it doesn't have any resistance and does this crazy stuff for purely quantum mechanical state. It's very similar to that. Very good idea. Very good thinking. By the way, I didn't tell her to ask that, right? So she, she came up with this by herself. <laughs> okay, last time. Anyone else wants to do it? Oh, maybe stay away. <laughs> so anyone else wants to do it? No? You do it? I put it here. Or take the other one. Oh. Grab it. And that's the best one, I think. Can give it a little push to kind of make it spin. Yeah, so, thank you for coming. Feel free to stay and play with it, but I mean, we kind of stay here forever, so feel just free, feel free to go whenever you want to. Um, also, thank you to all everyone attending at Zoom. I hope you enjoyed it. If you have questions, feel free to drop me an email. I hope you learned something, or at least you thought it was not boring, was kind of fun. And um, yeah, thanks for coming. Ah, next lecture, in case you kind of enjoyed it. Next lecture will be very different, but also fun. What glow in the dark, no levitation. Um, 